not in the same way that we do, but spiritual nonetheless on the surface, let's say. And in case you're wondering what this is all about, I'll just uh, give you a, a quick overview. Deep inside the computer worm that some specialists suspect is aimed at slowing Iran's race for a nuclear weapon lies what could be fleeting reference to the Book of Esther, the Old Testament tale in which the Jews preempt a Persian plot to destroy them. That use of the word murdus, which can be read as an allusion to Esther, to name a file inside the code is one of several murky clues that have emerged as computer experts try to trace the origin and purpose of the rogue Stuxnet program, which seeks out a specific kind of command module for industrial equip equipment. There are many competing explanations for Myrtis, which could simply signify Myrtle, a plant important to many cultures in the region. But some security experts see the reference as an allusion to the Hebrew word for Esther, and as a warning in a mount mounting technological and psychological battle as Israel and its allies try to breach Iran's nuclear project. Others doubt the Israelis were involved and say the word could have been inserted as deliberate misinformation to implicate Israel. Carol Newsom, an Old Testament scholar at Emory University, confirmed the linguistic connection, noting that Queen Esther's original name in Hebrew was Hadassah, which is similar to the Hebrew word for myrtle. Perhaps she said someone was making a learned cross-linguistic wordplay because the Iranians are already paranoid about the fact that some of their scientists have defected and several of their secret nuclear sites have been revealed. But whatever the origin and purpose, whether or not this is true, again, the fact that it's out there, the fact that people will come across this and see it, uh, you know, they, they're not grounded in uh, spiritual truth, uh, in the word of God, like we are uh, just, you know, besides himself, based on all the rumors and all the things that are going on in the world, you know, they see that, and then they think that there's a, a biblical connection to something that the world tells them is bad because it's causing all this, this trouble. I mean, it, it just speaks to the whole process that we're all familiar with. Well, in concluding, I think I would like to say that, uh, you know, a, a good indication that we're onto something here, or at least a good indication that we, we should at least give it a little bit more serious thought, serious time, and certainly prayerful consideration, is to take notice of the types of things that pop culture, mainly Hollywood, uh, is just pushing on us in regards to this subject. For the most part, nanotechnology hasn't shown up in too many places. Star Trek is probably the most obvious. Uh, some might say that the entire sequence from Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, uh, alludes to nanotechnology where it is explained that a young Anakin Skywalker has an unusually high number of, uh, what do they call it, mitochlorians or something uh, in his bloodstream. Could that be a hint of nanotechnology? Believe it or not, best-selling author Michael Crichton wrote a novel called Prey in which the plot involves the worst-case scenario regarding Grey Goo, uh, the same one that uh, Prince Charles tried to warn the world, world about several years back. But still, for all intents and purposes, the topic is fairly new since it first became a reality back in the mid-80s. Uh, I got to tell you, though, I think that's about to change. Any fan, or those of you who are familiar with uh, Battlestar Galactica, uh, the current spinoff called Caprica, um, you know that the story centers around this 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 concept and ability to transfer human consciousness consciousness into a microchip. And that's exactly what nanotech promises to do. In fact, many scientists believe that one day soon we'll be able to send molecular computers into the human body as nanobots so they can come into contact with every synapse in your brain. The purpose? Well, they say they want to download our thoughts connect it all to a collective hive-like mind, if you will. It's just all so surreal. Yet this is the reality that we are facing right now. It's no longer science fiction, but science fact. And I'll just, I'll just tell you about uh, you know, an experience I had with my kids. I have a, a five-year-old son, four-year-old daughter, and Another reason or another way you can tell that we might be onto something 
is by noticing the ways in which our children are targeted with this kind of stuff. I mean, I was sitting at home working, you know, on the laptop, kids watching their favorite cartoon on one of the cartoon networks. A commercial comes on for the hex bug, the hex bug nano bug. What? Obviously, the word hex caught my attention, and then I heard the word nano associated with it. So you better believe my head shot up from my laptop right away, and the remote was in hand. But that prompted me to go to the local Toys R Us and take a closer look at this hex bug. What is it? And I just want to show you. You can pass these around. You don't have to worry. There's, there's no live nanobots in here. They're not going to enter your body or anything. But let me ask you this. What, what business does a three-year-old have? This, is, this says it's for ages three and up. This is the sex bug case, carrying case. And inside, little vials. Check this out. It's ridiculous. Little vials of little uh, battery-operated nanobots, nanomachines. They're not hiding it. They're not, I mean, but, but I mean, would you let your three-year-old play with a vial of any, filled with anything? But this is being marketed to our kids. I know, you know, I know there are some people out there, uh, this is one of the things that some Christians have a problem with, with other Christians. You know, the fact that, you know, maybe we go to extremes over stuff like this. But we're talking about our kids and our grandkids here. There's nothing cool or fun about this. There's nothing cutesy, despite what this Nano Mini looks like, this little uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer-type dog and this little panda bear. I mean... Let's, let's, let's condition our kids and our grandkids to think that nanobots are cool, that they're fun, and that it make it become a part of their life uh, to, to where one day when it becomes as common as the silicone chip and it affects every facet of human life, they won't bat an eye. So I'll leave these up here in case you want to check them out. Uh, again, you don't have to worry about them, but... At the end of the day, we know Satan's tactics, and we have to be on guard. I mean, there's nothing cool or fun about nanotechnology, so don't buy what they're selling, which in my book, at least at this point in time, is nothing but a precursor to the Mark of the Beast system. The threat of mutating, self-replicating nanobots to move atoms, to change DNA, to even reassemble human tissue is far from being just theoretical. With fully evolved nanos, people could create out of this world whatever they imagine. They'd be as gods. If anybody could make anything, whether it's oil, food, houses, whatever, there would be no limits. No scarcity, but utter bounty. And potentially, and likely, utter chaos. Sounds like nanotechnology is the perfect tool and the perfect vehicle for Satan and the coming Antichrist. So please, as Christians, we need to be on guard against such things. Look into it a little bit more. And don't respond to any of this in fear. As Christians, we're not to have a spirit of fear. Rest on the most basic verse, the one that I'm so fond of saying all the time whenever I get into a discussion about the end times. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both, bowl, both soul and body in hell. Thank you and God bless.